you don't need to be a top performer and suffer mentally. And you can be a top performer and be in a good mental space by learning the tools to keep you there. No one's born with all the answers. And even as a top golfer, maybe top 10 in the world, um, two of my players were world top 10. One player was world number two, one player was world number three. You can't have all the tools to deal with, okay, how to deal with this when the SHIT hits the fan. Hi and welcome to Golf Yourself Healthy, the community of golfers who are unified in their belief that golf is good for you. My name is Chris Lynch, I'm your host. You are in store for an absolute treat today, a really, truly eye-opening, insightful and inspiring episode. Before I introduce today's guest, I am going to ask you very kindly if you would follow the podcast on your podcast platform of choice. If you believe that golf is good for you, if you want to hear a podcast where we bring a whole host of golfers, people from various golfing and life backgrounds to come on and talk about their own stories and their experiences, mine as well, in how golf is helping us with our health and well-being, then I really believe this is the podcast for you. So hit follow on your podcast platform of choice and that will make sure you are notified of new episodes as soon as they drop. Do also check out our back catalogue of journal articles written and contributed monthly by myself. They're all available over at golfyourselfhealthy.com. Links to that are in the show notes. So to today's guest, introducing today's guest, Ian Peak. Ian is, well, he hails from Bonnie, Scotland, much like myself. Ian is a master PGA professional, an honour which in the words of the PGA themselves, a prestigious and exclusive honour bestowed on the most worthy and exemplary of PGA members. If you look at the list of people that have been awarded that accolade, you will see that Ian is in really, really esteemed company. He is really one of the most respected PGA coaches in the game. People like David Ledbetter, Pete Cowan, a whole host of other probably household golf coaching names who coach at the highest level. That's certainly the case with Ian. But Ian not only coaches the, at the, the, the elite level with tour pros on the DP World Tour, for instance, he does also coach people like me, mere mortals like me and you, us club golfers, who are really just aspiring to be the best we possibly can be in our game of golf and in our game of life. And so just aside, as you'll tell yourself, Ian being a lovely, lovely man and such a pleasure to talk to, uh, and I, I think a really modest person as well with all his spectacular achievements, what really, really drew me to Ian and how I found out about him was thanks to the work he has recently done academically in the field of mental health in golf. Ian recently completed a, a PhD in social psychology at the University of Birmingham, where as part of his studies, he interviewed a broad range of former tour professionals, Ryder Cup players, past champions on the DP World Tour, to examine the mental health challenges faced by elite golfers both when they are at the top of their game, but also when their careers on tour start to come to their natural end. And most curiously, as part of his findings, many of these players, elite players that Ian spoke to, spoke of being depressed, in some cases feeling suicidal. And we, we know, because we've talked about it on this podcast before, mental health does not discriminate. And so to hear Ian talking about some of these players who are world number two, world number three, whatever, operating at the highest levels of professional golf, they're susceptible to it too. People feeling depressed and suicidal, even when objectively, and to any of us looking through our TV screens, for instance, would think, They've got all the money and the success and the happiness in the world. No, they're they're going through the mill too. And with all of this and with all of his studies and, and the, the outputs from that, 
you can tell Ian is really now very passionate about wanting to make a difference in this space and to raise awareness around mental health, to break the taboo, and obviously hopes that his research can prevent more golfers, not just the elite ones, but us too, in prevent us from suffering in silence. And so with that, you can, you know, Ian and what he talks about in this episode is so, so well aligned to our values and to our ethos here at Golf Yourself Healthy. I know you're going to enjoy this one. Please, if you do, consider sharing it with others who you think would benefit from hearing some of the inspiring and insightful anecdotes and advice that Ian has to share. But without any further ado, let's tee off and jump straight in. Well, Ian, welcome to Golf Yourself Healthy. Hi, Chris. Great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Looking forward to uh, spending this hour or so with you. Great. Likewise. Thanks for answering the call. And I suppose we, you know, we find ourselves here on Friday, the 25th of October. We're certainly in the UK. I would say the golfing season is almost all but over in earnest. I'm guessing where you find yourself in Germany, the climate's not a million miles behind where we are. So do you tend to hang up the golf clubs for the winter, Ian? Or are you sort of a, are you a fair weather golfer or do you go through? No, I'm a, I'm a social golf and I enjoy playing now as much as I can do in almost any weathers. I mean, I wouldn't play in my own, Chris, but uh, I've got a couple of buddies that I enjoy playing with and we'll go, as long as the course is open, we'll try and get out for maybe nine holes once a week, you know, social golf, have a good chat. He's a man similar age to myself, uh, Mike, my buddy, Michael Zetz. So we'll play for as long as the course is open, but once a week, it's kind of about the golf, but also having a good walk, having a good chat. I normally have to go for a coffee and a, a sandwich to, to swap stories. He's also a self-employed man like myself. It's a similar age. So it's um, with the social aspect being important, we'll play for as long as possible. Fabulous. I've just kind of put the last stroke of ink to my latest monthly journal article in which I was reflecting back on my own golf season and it kind of I saw it as a bit of a tale of two halves you know it started out with a lot of promise <laughs> loads of lofty ambitions and then it kind of ended with a wee bit of a tinge of disappointment so uh, you know how do you reflect on your on your own season or is it just more the social side these days you don't necessarily go into a golf season with big goals or anything uh, yes and no. I mean, one of the highlights for me now is, without doubt, playing golf on really good golf courses. So for the first time in 24 years, I had a golf buddies vacation. I went with my good friend Mark Pilling, a very good coach in the UK. We went to Ireland for five days in early September. And, uh, you know, so two of us playing great courses, Port Rush, Port Stewart, and Castle Rock, Ballywiffin, both courses at Ballywiffin. And definitely wanted to play well. But certainly that has leveled off with expectations of what I do. So if I played, let's say, once every two weeks in the summer, that'd be nine holes because it's busy in the summer. Then uh, I was fairly happy with what happened. I accepted it. I tried my best. We played match play every day, myself and Mark. So the, the scorecard wasn't too painful. And having come back from, from Ireland in September, we're already planning for next year. I'm going to add a new club to my bag. I'm going to work on my putting. I'm already working on my swing. So, yeah, within my own little world, I'm obviously keen to play the best golf I can be. I have no ambitions to play tournaments again, but to play a good social golf and maybe win the beer money or win lunch, win the bragging rights is still nice. So I guess it, my motivation is to play as well as I can do on really good golf courses. I just feel that, you know, I've got most from the, the, the most possible from the day. I benefit, mm. be, benefited from the day as much as possible. Yeah. I feel like the question I'm about to ask you is maybe skipping ahead just slightly, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyway and then yeah. follow on from that with asking you maybe just to briefly introduce yourself to the listener, what you do, and, and we'll get into talking about, you know, various other things. But something I really wanted to ask you about, Ian, is, you know, you work with a, a sort of a broad church of, of golfers from what I understand, but you do a lot of work in the elite side of the game. And something that fascinates me when I think about elite players, whether they're pros, tour players, or even the club golfer single figure handicappers of whom, you know, I've got a, a number of friends who are who have worked hard at the golf over the years. And sometimes what I see is the better you get at golf, the more your enjoyment gets marginalized. 
because, <laughs> you know, bogey becomes your enemy, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, and then I see guys being so hard on themselves. So I almost wonder in your experience, like, I don't know if there's a silver bullet or it's an easy question to answer, but I almost wonder what your philosophy is around, because it sounds to me like, as a person that's been around the game a long time, and I suspect plays quite well, mm -hmm. you still get enjoyment <laughs> out of it, and you kind of temper your expectation. I don't know. So how, how do you get enjoyment out of the game when you get to that level? Well, I mean, that's that's a great question. And I've got a couple of, of tough answers. I mean, anyone that's ambitious, you can't tell someone that's ambitious not to be ambitious. You can't. You know, that's the, the needs coming through. So if I take a little step back with a lot of the best juniors I coach, um, I support about 10, 12 of them at any one time. And almost all of them has aspirations to turn pro or go to college at, in, in the States first, or maybe they're at school already in the States. I do say at some point soon, this will become work. Golf will become work. If you're that ambitious, it will become work. So if you, you've got your, your work and your, your podcast. That's work as well. We enjoy doing it, but it's work to do it well. So number one is accepting it's work is important. So even if someone's busy all week and they're an ambitious golf, will get the handicap down, let's say, from nine to six or from, from four down to two, there is the absolute work. So with the work, we have planning, we have inputs, we have effort, we have disappointments. So to answer your question as well as I can do, if I am ambitious, I need to accept there's going to be frustrations. And part of that is how do I deal with those frustrations? They're going to come along like in life. So if I've set a goal, is it realistic? Setting unrealistic goals is a killer because they probably won't be reached. I think as a golfer, setting long-term goals is quite challenging as well. Long-term, I mean like a five-year plan. Let's have a 12-month plan to start with and see how much of that I can realise. But without doubt, for anyone that's ambitious, that would be to say, okay, this is actually work. The, my pleasure comes from reaching my goals or getting closer to my goals, improving. That won't always be possible. So what's my plan? What are my strategies for dealing with disappointment? And they need to be in place because there's going to be a lot of disappointment. And that's one of the tough facts with golf. So I work with a, a successful tour player at the moment who's won once this year. It's a very good season. He's, he's up over almost 20 positions on, on the money list from last year. But he's only won once and he's played 20 tournaments. And within those 20 tournaments, there's been a lot of disappointments. But the bottom line is he's getting better. So I think that would say it, you know, if I set ambitious goals, which are great, I'm ambitious, you're ambitious, it is having realistic goals and then ha also having a strategy, how do I deal with disappointment? Because there's going to be a lot of it, and that's a fact. Mm. How do you, mm. And if you can't deal with those disappointments, then the disappointments start to eat at you, and you probably get worse rather than better. That's yeah. tough. So it's definitely having a plan. You'll probably need some advice on how to deal with those. And that's probably the best chance you've got to keep going. A good friend of mine, oh. Stephen, Stephen Orr, once said, players don't quit if they can see they're still improving by a little bit. And that would be the work of maybe a coach or the self-reflection of a player saying, okay, today I didn't, I didn't improve my handicap, but what was good today? What can I take from today, which is positive material for next time? And if we not aware of those little wins we had despite maybe losing the battle, then the picture becomes kind of bleak, I'm afraid. That's number mm. one. How, mm. do, how am I going to deal with disappointments to help myself going forward? I almost wonder in what you were sharing there, it's something like, because, you know, I love certain parallels you almost draw back to, you know, it's it, for a lot of these people that you're working with, like you say, golf becomes work. But I when you and I get into the realms of talking about almost professional development, learning and development, this is totally, I love this because it's in my wheelhouse. Like that, by, by day, Golf Yourself Healthy is certainly not yet my day job, but you know, my, my professional day job is in HR and learning and development. And I always yes. think about, you know, 
goal setting, personal development plans. I'll, we'll come back to that in a moment, but I'm just wondering about, there's always sides to every job that you really love and there's stuff that gives you energy, but there's always sides to other jobs where you think, oh, I really don't like that side of it. And I wonder if even some of these tour players or, you know, th- there must be sides to it. Although it's work, they will get enjoyment out of certain parts of it. I don't know, they maybe just love the the short game or they love chip, you know, or whereas other people just loathe it or like they much prefer a different, do you know what I'm trying to say? You know, I do very well. I mean, you've, you've got a, a, a spectrum of, on the tour, you've got, all the tours, you've got a spectrum of personalities. Mm-hmm. There are definitely players that love working on their game. They get mm-hmm. up in the morning. I, I worked a player this year, 49 years old, been at the tour a long time, and he still loves getting up in the morning, working on his game, feeling he's doing work to get better. The early years on tour, even for the most, uh, sorry, for all the early years on tour, exciting for everyone. If, if you're on the DP World Tour, PGA Tour, even the Live Tour now, <clears throat> LET, um, LPGA Tour, it's exciting. New countries, new golf courses. and But then as with any work after a few years, you get used to the travel, you get used to the courses, nothing's quite as exciting as it was before. And then I would say the big excitement comes when you're in contention. You're playing well, the media is speaking to you, you're all over social media, and come the weekend, just teeing off in the afternoon, the TV cameras are on. So these are really the great career highlights. So I have phases of, you know, getting a new job, going to new places, playing new courses, playing in different environments. And then that will be replaced after probably two or three years, quite fairly quickly by, OK, I'm here to be in the mix on Sunday afternoon. It's about winning. It's about being forward. It's about growing my brand and, and income. So everyone loves being in contention on Sunday. If they weren't, they wouldn't be out there. The yeah. players that don't like that, they'd never make it because they never learn how to deal with that atmosphere. Mm-hmm. But everyone, everyone that's been at a few years, a bit of experience, they're looking to make the weekend and be in the mix Sunday after that. That keeps them going. They want to yeah. be in the last flight home on Sunday or in the first flight home on Monday rather than going home too early with a, a big trophy and a nice check in the back pocket. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's that's really fascinating. I mean, it's good to hear that actually, hopefully by and large, you know, I, I dare say being out on tour becomes, I mean, it's tough by, by all accounts that I hear, you know, keeping your cards, making cuts, etc. But it sounds like for a lot of the players you work with, it's still that self-improvement keeps the fire burning inside. You know, they kind of always want to be getting the marginal gains and, and getting some enjoyment out of it too, by the sounds of it. Ian, do you want to follow this up by, you know, telling the listener a, a bit about yourself and your background, and then let's maybe use that to lead you into talking about the the really fascinating PhD you recently completed and some of the insight from that, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm 56, uh, dad to three healthy young children, luckiest guy on earth, a wife who I hope <laughs> speaks to me. <laughs> no, I've got my <laughs> wife upstairs, a dog, dog owner as well, which is great. Skipper, we bought four weeks ago. So very lucky guy, good health. Professionally, a, a golf coach for 37 years now, a lover of the game, a lover of learning, my own learning and helping others to learn. And that, that kind of quest for knowledge and, and advancement took me to university at the ripe old age of, I think, 42, 43, I did a master's degree first uh, in sports coaching, Birmingham in England with Dr. Martin Toms as my supervisor. And I did my PhD with Martin as well, Martin Toms, from 2017 to 2023. And my fasc- fascination on both of the studies was looking at, you know, what, why do players make it and not to the big tour. So my master's looked at nine players that didn't make it to the tour. And with my PhD, I was very lucky to work with 16 players or have their support, their words, their stories on why they had successful careers. So nowadays I coach, uh, I coach at the club here once a week. My regular members, I still very much enjoy. And otherwise I consult, I do consult for the Swiss Golf Federation. I'm a research associate to the PGA European Tour, Dr. Andrew Murray has got me on board there, which is great. And I work with a bunch of players and other coaches privately and really do, a, I get a, a, quite a few different jobs, all to do with performance and well-being, looking after people. 
But anyone that picks up the phone to call me is looking to improve in a way in either lifestyle, whether it's parents or players or coaches or business managers. I work with a few of them as well about improving performance, their working performance, while being in a good place mentally. Okay, fantastic. And the so the PhD that you've done, can you just do a bit of framing around, you know, kind of what you were looking at and then kind of, you know, what what's kind of come out of that and, and almost if they're the outputs of it, almost how are they then going to practically be used for, for ongoing benefit? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was inductive. So inductive an inductive study means you don't know what's coming, which is great. You don't have a hypothesis, I believe. You think, well, let's go and see what's out there, which is absolutely complete right down my path. And uh, I see with Martin's guidance, Martin Tom's also uh, Professor Richard Bailey in Malaysia. He, Martin, uh, Richard is a big mentor of mine as well. They said, well, let's, let's see what's out there. Keep an open mind and, and go into this. And basically what I identified with these 16 players was my question was, you know, how did they survive life on tour? He said, it's tough, it's competitive, it's dog eat dog, it's big money, lots of people in the goldfish bowl looking to profit from the players, understandably. So I interviewed the 16 players involved three times over three years. I wrote over a million words, which I then condensed down to about 80,000. And basically what I found was how the players had to adapt to succeed. So every stage of the career, they had to adapt, they had to make changes to keep going ahead, like, like a Formula One car adapting to go faster, the driver adapting to go faster. And the exciting journey they had on the way up, how they got to the top of the game, which I didn't know before. And because these most of these men are, are very well known, the public figures, my findings, uh, Chris, were uh, embargoed, so they won't go to the public for another 29 years. And that allowed them over three years to I th- hopefully gain my trust and they talk very openly. And from that, one of the big things that came out was when things are going well, it, lovely jubbly, but when the players start to lose their game, the impact financially and also mentally was tremendous. And so much so in the course of the careers of the 16 players that supported me with their, 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 their thoughts and their tears and their exasperations, what they'd been through, you know, eight suffered depression or anxiety long term. So 50%. And see, seven of the eight, that was towards the end of their career when, let's say, the Titanic was sinking, you know, their career was gone or going and they didn't have the tools by no fault of their own to deal with that. So if I go on a maybe 90 degree turn from there, how that shaped my work now very much given me the tools, I think, to understand how high performance happens in a big picture. Hence my work with business managers, work with a couple at the moment, they're very, they're, they're doing great guns. But also with the high performance side, the work they do, how are you going to stay in a safe place mentally? And you can have both. You can. You don't need to be a top performer and suffer mentally which we're hearing more and more about now from the past. And you can be a top performer and be in a good mental space by learning the tools to keep you there. No one's born with all the answers. And even as a top golfer, maybe top 10 in the world, two of my players were world top 10. One player was world number two, one player was world number three. Another two were in the top 30 in the world for a number of weeks. I mean, really good. You can't have all the tools to deal with, okay, how to deal with this when the SHIT hits the fan. Mm -hmm. And these are things that people obviously can learn and understand to help them maintain high performance with a good, strong mental base for that. Ian, did you find in speaking to these players that did they almost give a in their mind, a like a, a core root 
cause that they believed had led to maybe the depression or that, you know, was it, was it that grind? Was it just by being around that environment and the intensity and the constant demands or that and or life circumstances, like things going on in personal lives as well? Well, again, it, it maybe sound obvious when things are going great, you can handle what life throws at you. But the big downturn for all of them, there was, there was a few of the lads talked about perfect storms, which I'll come back to. But the first, the absolute key downturn is not playing as well on the golf course. So if you no longer, if you, you if your work is no longer the standard that the business requires, so if you're not shooting the scores that the tour demands way to make checks, then that becomes quite a challenge because you've built up a lifestyle, the house, I'm going to say the cars, the private schools, the holidays for your family, maybe supporting other family members. So you've created this financial requirement, which your golf is the driver for, the golf is the supplier. And as soon as I start to play poorly over a longer period, not two or three months, a year, two years, then things then start to change financially because I'm no longer producing the goods on the golf course. And because I'm no longer producing the goods on the golf course, I'm less attracted to sponsors. I may lose my tour card for the big time, so I drop down a league. If you go from the DP World Tour to Challenge Tour, you're playing for 90% less money every week, sometimes 95% less money every week. That's a life changer. And these aren't in my head. These are facts that that changes my lifestyle. Now, these players, Chris, going through this, they, went, they didn't feel sorry for themselves. They didn't actually reach out to anyone a lot of the times. They kind of just got suffered and got on with it. But the big downturn was losing the form. And with that, often it'd be an injury in the background or they'd be, make a poor social decision. A poor social decision could have been firing a really good caddy, firing their coach. So you've got a poor social decision, leaving someone or moving on. You may have a physical injury and there's a financial hit. And these things are kind of coming at a similar time. You've got a perfect storm and that's a downward vortex. So they were sucked down away from where they'd been. And because they didn't have the support, they couldn't get back. Now, one of the players suffered for 10 years. You know, these aren't lightweights, you know, like as in, you know, people that give up because this is what they knew. They knew who they'd been, but they didn't have the tools, they didn't have the actual support team to say, look, how can we get back on track? And because they didn't have the tools and the support team didn't have the tools, it was just going south. Mm. And that was pretty much the story of, say, seven of the of the eight. The eighth player, he suffered fairly strong depression at the height of his career. He became overwhelmed with life, as, as we all have at times. It was just too much for him. But he got back through good support. A good GP, a good psychologist, some medication. Took him a year. And he came back. And there for me in a nutshell is the value of a coach, the value of the right support team at the right challenges. But on the two, it's getting better. Dr. Andrew Murray is doing a great job. Dr. David Prosser, Dr. William Winterby are out there on the tour, doing tremendous work for the tour and for the players and actually also the staff. So it's way better. But back in the day, there weren't the support systems there. The team around the player may have been a golf coach, a manager, a caddy, a fitness coach, but no one really looking after the mental welfare. And that was the killer. That was the killer. That, that was the missing tool to arrest, say, okay, what's going on here? Having strategies to deal with those, that life crisis, which it was. Mm. Something that comes to mind here is this expression you hear, which is mental health or mm -hmm. depression, for example, doesn't discriminate. 
you know, yeah. and find it so fascinating to hear that you've got one of these players who top of their game, enjoying objectively enjoying great success, yet experience depression. I think that example talks to it. I mean, I think it's also something that you get me thinking about is, you know, the the culture, let's say, around golf, around professional sport. I think, you know, just ahead of our conversation this morning, I've, I've been thinking about how in the recent past, you know, there are people very high profile, and even outside of golf, like people like Simone Biles, I think the the gymnast, like some of these athletes are getting vilified, if that's the word, almost for like being vulnerable you know, about their mental health. And I just wonder how do, you know, in speaking to these players, obviously they were able, that you said before, they, they felt able or better able to open up to you knowing that this research is under lock and key and they yeah. don't need to worry about it getting out. So, yeah. so that's enabled them to open up. But I dare say some of these may come from a generation or, you know, a sort of a demographic where speaking about this generally anyway is difficult. So did you notice any, like how, how was that journey for them to almost admit to that vulnerability? Oh yeah. I mean, very difficult. If I could go back again, I need to say a word there. So the player, and this is, you know, I'm not going to be a pessimist, but again, the player that was at the top of his game and suffered depression, he wasn't really enjoying it at the top of the game. And that's fairly typical. Mm. They enjoy the money. They enjoy the trappings. They enjoy, excuse me, they appreciate what they can give their kids and their family. But it's work. It remains work. It remains pressure every day to perform, to justify the big bucks of the contracts, to be nice to the right people, to show up, but for, most of all, to perform every week to the standard that you've shown you can do. And that would be what, certainly one of my, uh, the player I'm working with this year, he and I chat most, most weeks, he said he finds it still very difficult to play social golf with friends and sponsors because he's in this tunnel. He's over 50, successful man, and he still finds it difficult because it's what on the golf course he's got to work. He's got to show himself and prove what he can do. So enjoying the trappings, enjoying the Netflix documentaries, absolutely. But it's, it is work. It's, it's very well paid work, but it's demanding. It's a demanding product they produce of themselves. Mm. To go to the vulnerability thing, I mean, one of the, one of the players is still a young man. Now he's a uh, mid forties and he had a very bad hit with depression and anxiety. Let's see, 10 years ago when his career went south and he thought he was the only one suffering this. 2016, 2015. Wow. You know, he, you see the news, you hear, but, but you think no one can be suffering like I can, suffered in silence for many years. Mm -hmm. So, again, we have the stigma there of, you know, a, let's say mental injury being less valuable or some sort of weakness. Of course, it isn't. It can impact all of us. But the, yeah, part of what the challenge was admitting having been so, having fought so, so strongly for so long, like a gladiator on the golf course, to then admit I can no longer raise my sword, I can no longer raise my shield and battered. That's a that's a difficult journey for many because mm -hmm. they play this out in the public eye. Mm. You know, every week they see the scores and they go into school. What was wrong today? Ah, I was, you know, I've got a, not quite working on my swing, but and hating being there, but you can't tell anyone that. It's a long journey. Do you think or do you experience that, you know, you know, because I've shared with you and my listeners know about, you know, I've I've experienced tragedy in recent times in my life, losing my son last year. And I play golf partly to remember him now. And I, I've looked at stories out there of professional golfers on the big tours who have been through similar things. And I notice how maybe a good long time after the event, it comes up in the news or they, they talk about it or whatever. But I just almost wonder, is there an element in, in elite golf or professional golf where their management team or people around them almost say, 
almost to protect them, don't like grieve in public or don't sort of like maybe keep this. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like a distraction to elite performance. If you're, do you get what I'm saying? I do. I do. I think in the, in the, in the past, that might have been the case. I mean, like mm. any business, you have good golf coaches, you have poorer golf coaches, you have good psychologists, poor psychologists, you have good managers in golf and you have some charlatans. I mean, there was a few that were described as Shylocks during my PhD. So again, it's, but the good managers are busy because they show they care about their players. The poorer managers that just say for the cash, they tend to have fewer customers and their business isn't successful. So certainly now, I think with men generally having a greater awareness and acceptance of the challenges to mental health that are there, the managers have become more aware of what can happen. And I think and I hope things are getting better. I know Ian Stoddart managed a great reputation among the players for being a carer, a Scottish, uh, another Scotsman. So he's got a great reputation among the players as caring about the players, not just how they're playing, but them personally. And I guess, I hope, I'm sure as, as things develop, there'll be more managers like that out there. It's been poor in the past, but I think, I'm sure now things are getting better. I go back to what Dr. Murray's doing on tour, Dr. William Winter B, Dr. David Prosser, I'm helping on the edges. I think things will continue to improve. Certainly the DP World Tour, I know the LPGA, I've also got Dr. Julia Mato out there helping the, the ladies on the LPGA. That's great as well. So let's That's hope things great. are getting better, but certainly the signs are good because it's yeah. time, it's got to happen. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, maybe a couple of final thoughts or, or kind of reflections for you just to provoke maybe a, a wee bit of discussion around this point was... <laughs> When you and I spoke the other week in advance of this conversation, I shared with you, and, and a part of this podcast is about storytelling, right? And so I was fascinated how when my wife and a few friends of, uh, of ours went to the AIG Women's Open at Walton Heath last year, uh-huh. we came away from the golf course and we went into the festival village and Di Doherty was going to be in conversation with this mystery guest. And it was like, uh-huh. you know, building the suspense and and out came Sam Torrance, who I love. I, I just like as as a Scot and yeah. as a legend of the game, sure. I was like, I... you know. And I looked at my mate Andy, and he he recalls how my face was like a kid at Christmas, kind of like, oh, it's Sam Torrance, you know. Yeah. And he and he came out, and you know, he was he was entertaining as Sam always is. But what I find most fascinating was what he was sharing his perspective with Di Doherty around psychology and golf, and almost. I think it was partly slapstick, but partly, you know, his actual opinion as well and perspective on it was, it's almost like the game's gone soft kind of thing. It was was like a generational thing. And look, I'm not throwing shade at Sam or anything like that. I just find it deeply, you know, fascinating. And there was this interesting back and forth between him and his daughter who was in the front row of the crowd. And she was like, oh, I go to a therapist and it's brilliant. And it was a, it was it was a bit weird, but it was banter between the two of them. But yes. it just got me to thinking about how, and drawing back to what you've been saying about your research, you know, I think whether it's in golf or it's in society in general, like demographically, like the Gen Z and the millennials, and there are plenty of them on tour now, mm-hmm. care more about, like they talk more about well being. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. very much on their radar. It's not just on their radar, they want to talk about it. And it's interesting what you're saying about the trappings of the tour. A lot of these pros, they get maybe into their forties or their fifties and they almost feel like a sense of need to keep on getting the paychecks in. But I'm really Uh drawn to how you've got examples like Andrew Beef Johnston, right? Who is, is kind of almost making a side career in golf media around the outside of his of his pro game. So I'm almost wondering, like, this is almost like a twofold reflection question is, are you now seeing what you just said about the tide? It sounds like the tide's turning a little bit. There's like Mm -hmm. mental wellness. There are things being done by Dr. Mm -hmm. Andrew Murray and the, and the DP world tour, the things are being put in place, but also are you seeing almost tour golfers, the younger generation of tour golfers boxing a bit more clever around the stuff and knowing that actually your tour career may not be the be all and end all. You've got to almost be think about life after it now sometimes as well, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's a, a very good question. There's a few angles there to it. 
if I mean people can change. So I'll give it give an example and bear with me. I'm one of them. So mm. I remember when COVID hit in obviously 2020, we're all home, everyone's watching a podcast every day. And the PGA at the Belfry, the British PGA, who I'm a, a proud member of, they put on a podcast for the PGA coaches, PGA members about about mental well-being during COVID. And there's a good friend of mine, David Carney, Irish colleague, and Dr. Paul Gaffney, very good Irish psychologist. And I listened in. I thought, yeah, I could I could see how that will. Um, some people could benefit from that. I don't need it. I'm great, right? And that was I was then I guess 52, and I'd never suffered from depression. I'd never suffered from anxiety. Well, roll on two years later at 54, I was calling Dr. Paul Gaffney about anxiety on my behalf. So I had 54 years before I was hit by anxiety, and it was tough. Now, luckily, knowing as much as I do about social science, I knew, OK, I need to get some help here. He was the first man I called actually after David Carney to, to talk about it because Dave's been through this as well. So if we go back to Sam's thing, I would say absolutely. I'm not a depressive, no anxiety, very lucky in life. I've had no major tragedies to date. But things can happen and they will swipe the rug away from under your feet where you'll need you'll need some help so that would be number one and having gone through this now and I'm, I'm out the other end way more empath empathetic to anyone that's going to go through this I get what they're going through I can understand it so that's been to my benefit now if we go to the younger generation there's just generally better education Chris so think we're talking about, we're aware of things now, whereas they would never be discussed before. If we go back to, you and I grew up in Scotland, I'm older than you, and without generalising, we had a lot of granddads that came back from the war, saw a lot of tough stuff, and I never heard anyone talk about what they went through in the war. The men. And I wonder, and I, I, Scotland was a tough place. Scotland was pretty quick to trade punches where I come from. And I wonder how much of that was buried psychology from our granddads that were in war, passing it on to their sons and daughters. And how much was, how much, let's say, psychological challenges were funneled into physical violence. Whether it was Friday night down the pub, Saturday night down the pub, Sunday at the football, whatever. So I, I would that would be my challenge. That would be my, my, my question going back to generations was how did they deal with the challenges they definitely had? You're coming home with four kids and a, a small wage packet you need to supply. I don't think these demands, mental demands have changed. We deal with them maybe differently now, but I would say a lot of the stuff that was ignored was to the detriment of society in the past mm -hmm. that would be my that would be yeah. my hypothesis and things luckily are changing yeah and that's quite that's quite deep and quite heavy but that's yeah yeah well you know? i mean go, go, going back to if sam torrance is listening to this he's like my name's getting <laughs> Hi, dropped sam. in uh, <laughs> he's like my name's getting dropped in this quite a lot here but the reason i'm bringing them up again is because my wife and i again went to uh, we were away, we stayed a, a night at Celtic Manor recently because it's quite yeah. close to where we live and the friends we were staying there with, we weren't there for golf reasons, but we went up to the Rafters restaurant, which is by the 2010 course. And we had dinner there and obviously there's pictures everywhere of mm -hmm. past Ryder Cup captains and there was one up of, of Sam Torrance and I was telling my friend, Graham, the story that I've just told you, you know, and about this kind of whole generational outlook on on mental health and things. And to the point you just made about wartime, he reminded me, or uh, not rem educated me in a way, we said, remember, the whole keep calm and carry on thing effectively originated out of the whole keep going, we're getting bombed, but like, you know, don't moan about it. Like there's all, there's someone out there who's got it worse off than you kind of thing, which effectively in a way, from what I understand, almost served to, like you see, bury the, like keep all that stuff boxed in under the surface and 
and it has to come out in time, you know? So well, Yeah, I think I mean, remember back to my, my dad died in 2018 and he was 78. And I think back to all of his pals and what have you, I'm, they're all the same, absolutely tough as nails, mm. borderers, Glaswegians, they're tough as the, the Abaddonians, tough as nails, tremendous. But they, they, maybe they, that was the thing, they dealt with things by burying it, but it, things didn't disappear. You know, they were mm. there and things are changing. But it, it, it is a fascinating subject. And Sam <laughs> Tons is actually one of my dad's favourites. He loves Sam. Proper man, proper man, which is great, you know. But, it, you know, the challenges were there in the past and where they dealt with, who knows. But, and the, well, as again, we can't, you've got a spectrum of people between, you know, let's say less sensitive and highly sensitive genetically and also epigenetically, you know, things they learn as they go along. Mm, mm. But certainly society's changing. But, um, well, the old breed were tough, didn't mean they didn't suffer, but maybe just buried it or the pain was dispersed in different ways that maybe yeah. some were some were nice and some were less pleasant mm. you know just a final thing like a final reflection on the tide turning and times changing and things i heard this soundbite recently where i think paul mcginley and brandel shambly were talking about how a lot of the pros now i think like ricky fowler or someone had said like nice shot to his fellow you know and paul mcginley's like what's this all about back in my day we wouldn't be egging each other on and telling each other oh good one mate you know good shot and whatever but it was almost a disinteresting reflection on how again like there's there's just a different way in which players are maybe kind of showing up for each other a wee bit more now it's not I don't know. Maybe not quite as it is doggy dog in a, obviously, but like it's just it's interesting observing just how this this sort of stuff is playing out now in in the public eye as well. Well, it was interesting. My PhD threw up a, a really, I think, a, without doubt, a unique, uh, a new aspect on play, and it was it was game face. Mm -hmm. And you still have two schools of of player. You have the toughies, classic, be a tiger. A Patrick Reed that will blank their op opponents in the course because they feel that's the best for them. But then you'll have the chatties who will praise the playing partner, have a little chat in between shots. I think that's always been the case. You go back to Sam's day, he was the younger player, said he was good company in the course. If you got to know him, you have a nice chat with him. So there's certainly two game faces there. There's certainly some tough young players out there, but there's some chatties as well. And it's the players making a choice. So if I'm a chatty, you know, that's going to help me play my best golf. If I'm a chatty, that's not my best golf. So I'm going to stay a toughie. I'll talk to my caddy, but I don't want my opponents to think um, or help them by being nice to them. So definitely two schools of thought there in stroke play. Match play, pretty much everyone's a toughie. You, you know, that's it. You're one against one. But stroke play, I would say those that are enjoy some chat between shots at the right time. Padre Harrington, you go back many years, you see him as a, a good chatty at the right time. You know, that's a benefit to the game. It's not so much mm. about being nice to the partners, but knowing, just switching off and having that bit of small talk is good for my game. And the mm. other the other player enjoys a bit of chat as well. So it, it kind of wins me friends. I love that came up in your research. Do you know what, actually, when this episode's done and the call to action, I always like to give a call to action to my audience, will be, are you a chatty or a toughie? Yeah. That's what I'll ask my audience. Ian, what are you, a chatty or a toughie? Me or my chatty? Good. Absolutely. And, and you know, actually, if I go back, I tried to be a toughie as a kid and it was useless. I, I was, that just wasn't me, you know. I played my best, I, I played my best golf, relaxed between shots, having a chat. You could switch on and off easy. It's not difficult. Mm. So unless you are, yeah, there's not there's not many toughies out there that benefit from it, because you know you're out there for five hours. Let's say, unfortunately, now maybe three and a half hours if you're playing in Scotland or Ireland, and you're out there, you can just switch on and switch off quite easily in a shot. You don't need to be in the zone for five hours or four hours. So switching off saves the batteries, and you can switch back on when you approach the ball. Kind of ten meters to the ball, he's kind of switch back on. Mm -hmm. So unless you're a natural toughy, which means, yeah, you don't really enjoy the company of others too much, you know. You see, the toughies on course generally tend to be probably possibly less sociable off the course as well. You know, it's kind of 
it's not difficult for them to say little. Whereas if you're quite sociable, off course, if you enjoy company, see the Irish players together, the Scots now uh, at tour events, the French, the, 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 the Spanish, you know, within the nations, you know, if someone's chatty at dinner, they'll probably like a little chat on the golf course as well. And that's fine. Yeah, but I mean, it's very, I, I won't take us deep on this, but I, I really, I listen to a number of golf podcasts and pros talking about this and how they've said, like someone like Eddie Pepperell talks a lot about how there's a real contrast between the camaraderie and, and what you've described on the DP World Tour. Yeah. And when they go to the PGA Tour, it is much more like in the players' lounge when they're eating. They're eating on their own. They're not like some maybe. I don't know. Who, who knows? Maybe that'll change in time too. I want to ask you a, a couple other things. I want to ask you about in this conversation. Please. So go, yeah. goal goal setting, right? Yeah. So again, the the learning and development professional in me is all about thinking about like smart goals and having you know setting yourself kind of targets and things. So a golf season is pretty much done now. It won't be long before people are already thinking about kind of what their next season's got in store. Like what to you? You know, when you were your coaching clients or whatever, what 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 does what does good goal setting look like to the club golfer, especially? Well, uh, great. I think number one, it's realistic. Mm. You know, the coach has got to be realistic. So, if someone's playing off an eighteen handicap, and they say, "I really want to improve this year." So, you know, what you know, how would that look? You know, what would, what would your outcome be? Let's see, yeah, outcome goal. And they say handicap six. I would say, no, come on, it's not going to happen. Because I've, mm. I've got a responsibility as a coach and knowing the game to set realistic goals. I say, can we get down to 12 first or maybe 14 first? If we hit 14, we move on from there, right? So it's going to be realistic. And so that's maybe the, the outcome goal and then quickly moving into the process goal. So how will we get there? What are we going to do to get there? So we've got the dream at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, the dream at the end of the year. And then it's about our process, our plans. How much time do we have to practice? How will we practice? How many tournaments can we play? Where will the tournaments be? How will we get ready for them? What can we do off course? How do we balance that, Chris, with life, with the family, with the kids, with the parents, with the dog, with, you know? So again, I would say there's th three steps. It's a realistic outcome goal. Then we go into the processes. And with your process, you need to be aware of the other life circumstances which will get in the way. You know, if I if I say I'm going to practice five times a week, I've got three kids that have eight hobbies, it's not going to happen because they are actually more important than my golf. So again, what's realistic for me? So what's my outcome? Realistic. What are my processes? And with the process plan, how will they fit into my life? to make the processes worthwhile and, again, realistic, doable. Now, if someone's got, and I see it all the time, but if someone's got more than three goals, then forget it. It's too much. You're not going to achieve them. One goal is nice, two goals okay, maximum of three, realistically. If you've got seven or eight goals, like, you're going to forget them. I mean, it's not, going to, it's not, it's not that real. So the mm -hmm. fewer goals, the better. Make Love them it. valuable. Good. I think I'm going to ask you one final question around, because again, I've heard you in other podcasts talk about, you know, a part of your work is working with aspiring juniors yeah. and that gives you then the exposure to and the relationships, say, with their parents, right? And yeah. the parents can play a very key role in the well-being, <laughs> I guess, yeah. of, of that child. Mm -hmm. I guess... My, as I've shared with my listeners before and part of my personal journey, my wife, probably any day now, is going to give birth to our daughter. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to lie to you, Ian. I'd love it if my daughter got into golf, but I'm not going to force her to, you know. Yeah. But almost my question for you is, drawing on the work that you do in this in this space, is like, how how can I or how can any parent encourage their child in a sporting environment? Yeah, well... Great question. I mean, you, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to take the pressure, I'm going to put it to me, because uh, my boy, my oldest boy, Teddy, plays golf now. So, as an educated man and educated audience, your, our input needs to be holistic. So, there's three angles we need to cover, or three if you're in Germany, right? 
first of all, physically. So let's say you want your, your daughter to play golf. I want, I'm happy that Teddy plays golf. Maybe his brother will, will you know, come and play as well. And the sister Katie is slightly younger. So number one is physically enabling that. Sounds simple, but take them to the golf course, take them to the range, taking them for an ice cream after the golf course and the range, or take them to McDonald's, right? So that's physically involved. You need social involvement. They'll probably enjoy it just as much or more if there's more friends playing. So you're going to have at some point a what's a parents group, primary school, kindergarten, grammar school, whatever it is, high school, whatever it is. And you probably want to look socially who else could get involved in the game of golf. Especially for young girls, it's quite boring, quite intimidating being on their own with dad, just with dad or just with mum. So girls, I think, my experience, enjoy the socialness more, right? So that's the social aspect of holistic involvement. And finally, psychologically, you've got to keep the pressure off. It's about saying, did you enjoy today? What did you enjoy? What wasn't so good about being there? Not her performance, but the game itself. Oh, it was too cold, Daddy. Okay, well, we'll go again when it's warmer. Or the... The man on the range wasn't very friendly today. I said, what did he say? Oh, you, I was too young to be in the golf course. Oh, all right. So I might have a chat with him and make sure that doesn't happen again. You know, being lonely. Oh, I didn't really be here moan. So, well, I'll come and hit some balls with you as well. Or should we ask Jenny if she wants to come next time? Should we bring the dog next time? So you're going to consistently, like in life, I mean, I'm a, I see high performance as a holistic endeavour. So you're going to look at physical, physical enabler, social, probably wants her friends to get involved in and psychologically seeing the right things. And seeing the right things is pressure off, no performance pressure. Actually, if she doesn't want to go and practice, she doesn't. What do you want to do today instead? We'll do that. Mm. One, of, one of the psychologists I enjoy working with, Dr. Riley Sfarg, she says that just because you've got a boat doesn't need, mean you need to go sailing every day. You know, the club's in the corner of the room. And we can't, they're not many us. They, we don't, we don't have the, the right to try and make them like us and like what we like. And, um, that's really important. You know, and then they'll develop, you know, as kids hit teenagers, puberty, they'll become more focused. They'll make a decision. They'll probably, you know, they should try a lot of sports when they're children. They'll make a choice. I'm going to specialize or I want to quit. I want to be good at something or actually I can leave this. And we've got to go with them in the journey, always listening. I had a, a coffee yesterday with Ted's golf coach, uh, Caroline Malone, who's a great coach at our club here. She's the main coach. And I let her talk. And she said, yeah, Teddy and Emilian and, and little Mike, they like to have the little chats during the session. I just leave them to it. And I didn't say anything, but that's what I want to hear. Because Ted, I said, I pick him up or I'm, I'm in the cafe, I'm, I'm pudding. I said, how was it? I said, yeah, I really enjoyed it. So okay, and if that's if that's getting him going back to the golf course every week, he's eleven. It'll be twelve next month. I'm happy with that. Mm. He can play the course, and who knows what will come. His mum's a, a keen tennis player, tennis coach. My wife, he's playing tennis as well. He loves basketball. He's playing basketball this afternoon. So that's just physically enable it. They're playing with friends and ask the right questions say the right things and the right things are almost always pressure free you know love it no that's brilliant advice um well I think it's, I'll... yeah we don't get it we get it wrong every day you know we'll get it wrong every day it's like okay what's the plan what's the what does the model look like physical enabler good social circle and see the right things dad and mum amazing you know and then they'll tell us hopefully i don't like this okay sorry we got this wrong let's go for an ice cream do something different next time for Listen sure. to them. It, you know, it's simple, but autonomy, give them choice. It's, it, yeah. Give them choice. I was, I was thinking as well, you know, just if your son, uh, Ted, did you say Teddy? Aye, Teddy, is, is yeah, he, Ted's uh, my, could, uh, oldest boy. And he, if he comes off and says, I really enjoyed it today, it's also like a tell me more type question. What did you enjoy about it? Like almost getting the child's brain to open up and kind of go, really think about it like not just like okay you enjoyed it brilliant let's go off for an ice cream let's okay. kind of yeah I, I tend to ask you know what did you enjoy most 
and he'll say, hit the driver. Everyone, you know, they'll have to hit the driver as far as they can. It went 120 metres, Daddy. Great. But I know he's having, enjoying the chat with the boys as well. Yeah. Uh, and he's involved. Karen's a good coach, so they're involved all the time. And, you know, that's important. Um, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And we played a couple of times early, early doors. The sun went out at six o'clock, played a few holes. And as, as I said, Teddy, you tell me when you want to stop. Hole six, Daddy, I've had enough. Okay, let's walk back. Enough. You know? Just just be there for them. Absolutely. Ian, I'm going to wrap it up there. However, I will say that I've loved this conversation. I'm sure my listeners will do too. <laughs> I hope it's not a one and done. I hope you might consider no. coming back another time. And, you my know. pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. It's, you know, one of the main things I learned my PhD, one of the, the players, he, um, very, very successful. That's, that's way smarter than I. And he said, you know, when you, when you talk to the press and you get into it, you hear yourself. So you and I talking, you know, opens up memories for me and challenges for me, which is great. It's like, you know, it's almost like, um, yeah, looking in the mirror and, and remembering things of value. So yeah, tremendous. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> tremendous for me. Tremendous value for me as well. Um, really, that's great. And, and thanks, you know, just for, for what you've shared, both, you know, on behalf of the, 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 the people you work with and the research you've done, but also for you personally. I, I think, uh, this podcast is largely about people's own personal stories too, never mind just the, the SME work that they do. So I'm glad yeah. you felt able to share that stuff here and, Pleasure. and Pleasure. find it useful. Thanks, yeah. Ian. Great. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Do remember to follow us on your podcast platform of choice. And if you would like to get in touch with the show, you can email me. My email address is in the show notes. Or alternatively, if you listen on Spotify, for example, you can use the comments feature to drop a few words about what you liked about this episode or what you like about the show or indeed any feedback or ideas for future episodes. But until the next time, remember to always embrace the rough and forever cherish the fairway.